Hist 3710, Nazism, Stalinism, and the Rise of the Total State. Week 3, Lecture 3, The Scientific Management of Society. So what do I mean by this title, The Scientific Management of Society? Well, in the narrowest sense, I use the phrase in reference to economic planning. So you might remember from the seminar on uh, Friedrich and Brzezinski's totalitarian syndrome that the uh, Nazi and Soviet economies were both planned. That is, production and to a very high degree consumption as well were mapped out by the government four and five years in advance. The state, in that sense, replaced the market as the mechanism by which supply and demand were matched. Now, as with other sessions, that is, on propaganda, political police, family policy, and so on, that will approach uh, in the coming weeks, I want to ask here, what makes central planning totalitarian? And part of that answer involves exploring the prehistory of the idea of economic planning and European experiments with economic planning before the Nazis or Bolsheviks came to power. But I don't want to talk about planning only. As I mentioned, planning is only the narrowest understanding of the title scientific management of society. Planning is only one way in which scientists, philosophers, and politicians have proposed to improve society. So this is about how specialists, philosophers of one kind or another, technologists might seek to improve society. So in the case of planning, it's about improving on the capitalist market. Okay, um, But there are other ways in which one can use science, technology, and human reason to improve society or government, um, the polity, and so on. So here we need to return to the 18th century and the Enlightenment, okay, which we have talked about off and on uh, in the first two lectures. So the Enlightenment is an age that inspired a great faith in scientific progress. So it is the Enlightenment that produced the interest in exploring the potential of science to improve and even to perfect the organization of society. And in this sense, I want to look at communism and Nazism, as well as other experiments in social engineering as part of the same Enlightenment project. And that should give us a broader sense of the European or Western context of Nazi and Soviet planning. Now, let me start with this broader sense of scientific management, and specifically with the individual who is commonly acknowledged as the first philosopher of the scientific management of society. And here I'm talking about Claude-Henri de Rouvroy, uh, forgive my French accent, Comte de Saint-Simon, usually simply referred to as Saint-Simon, whose dates, birth and death are 1760, born 1825, died. 1760 to 1825. Now, like many figures of the Enlightenment, Saint-Simon was devoted to the cause of improving man's power over his environment. So he shared the idea that historical development was measured in terms of the advancement of human knowledge. Not only did he believe that the organi organization of society was a crucial subject of scientific inquiry, but that the application of human reason had the potential to perfect society. 
And one of his contributions to this end was to promote the idea that workers and industrialists, at least those who proved themselves to be the best organizers of production, should be put in charge of government and the planning of great public projects. So together with the country's leading scientific minds, according to Saint-Simon, they, that is, these industrialists and uh, technologists, rather than the nobility or the military, would be the governors of Napoleonic France. So this idea that these technocrats should be on the leading council of a collectively planned society. Saint-Simon's idea of the scientifically managed society was developed and elaborated by generations of idealists who followed him. Though we should observe that the dominant ideology of the 19th century was liberalism, with its emphasis on the efficiency provided by the unfettered function of free markets and individual choice. That is to say, it is a completely different philosophy. Small government, unfettered markets that dominates the 19th century. And nevertheless, the idealists remain, but they're very much a minority in the background. Now, in large part, the dominance of liberalism in the 19th century can be explained in terms of the great and growing power of industrialists in the course of the Industrial Revolution. In part, though, the idea of the scientifically management society was relegated to the status of a utopian ideal because it was technologically too complex for the 18th century. Laissez-faire capitalism, on the other hand, was well, laissez-faire. A scientifically managed society, however, required great bureaucracies of record keepers, managers. It needed engineers and all sorts of other specialists. And in Saint-Simon's time, in the early 1800s, the state simply wasn't able to do much more than collect taxes and to collect grain to feed the cities and conscripts to fight in the army. So governments in the 18th century were involved really in little more than the extraction of resources. However, by the middle of the 1800s, by the middle of the 19th century, with the great improvements in the transportation system, that is roads and railways, in improvements in communications, telegraph and the post, and with the vast increase in education and the expansion of the state and its capacity for record keeping, it was suddenly possible for governments to contemplate undertaking far more ambitious projects more ambitious tasks. In short, it was possible for the first time for the state to contemplate improving the social, political and economic order as Saint-Simon had hoped and planned for, thought about. So the state now has the capacity, okay, by the middle of the 19th century, to be much more involved, to consider how it might scientifically manage society. But that doesn't mean there is a motivation. I have to think about what the motivations were for the state getting more involved. Okay? And these motivations that we're going to consider now are various. Okay? So we'll think about overcoming backwardness, social engineering, providing economic and social stability, and preparing for war. And these, I freely admit, I have nicked from James Scott, a book called Seeing Like the State, which I would encourage you to take a peek at. So we'll start with overcoming backwardness. Now we're thinking about motivations for the state to take a bigger role, to become larger, to be more involved in uh, management 
societies and thinking about the scientific management of society. So our first uh, motivation is overcoming backwardness. Okay, so overcoming backwardness. Um, the state then in the middle of the 19th century is beginning to focus on overcoming backwardness in its many forms. So for example, the state is getting involved in improving hygiene and public health. The state is involved in improving the housing stock and in the uh, organization of cities, in the organization of production, for example. Uh, so uh, the state is uh, engaged in promoting the mechanization of agriculture. The state is involved in engaging in huge public works projects, dams and superhighways and the like. Um, okay, so the state then is involved in overcoming backwardness by engaging in all of these projects and uh, uh, programs, okay? And it all sounds very sensible, doesn't it? Uh, that the state should be doing this sort of thing, where it can make a positive difference for society. But of course the European states don't stop there, okay? So their engagement in scientific management is not just about improving economic efficiency or through hygiene improving longevity, okay? The state is involved in scientific management in other ways. So having looked at overcoming backwardness, we want to think about our next point, which is social engineering. So there's a great and growing interest in social engineering in the late 19th century, particularly insofar as it promised to control and improve the working classes. So we're thinking about things like temperance campaigns to keep the working class from drink. The state is involved in encouraging sporting leagues, that is to manage the free time of the uh, working classes. Um, education is something that the state is involved in and that this is what we discussed uh, in the lecture last week. That is to make uh, ordinary citizens into patriotic uh, citizens. Now as we'll see in the seminar on eugenics, there were even projects to limit procreation uh, of uh, the working classes in order to protect the genetic stock of the nation. Okay, So this sort of conviction that the backward parts of society could be transformed follows the same sort of logic that justified colonial expansion in the 19th century. Okay, The idea that you can improve uh, the and bring out of backwardness the colonies. You can do the same with your working class. And this applies not only to Britain and its colonies, but also to Germany, Spain, France and Italy. We get a similar sort of logic. So the advocates of colonial expansion argued that the advanced states of Europe could engineer the peoples of Africa and Asia out of their backwardness. That they could engineer their working classes uh, out of backwardness. So social engineering is our second point. The third point is providing stability. So this is motivations for, the st for state experiments in scientific management. So there's also a strong sense that the state could do much more than it was doing uh, in the earlier parts of the 19th century to stabilize the economic and social order. Now we have to remember that the 19th century and early 20th centuries was a time, they were times of colossal change and instability. Now we've already touched on the process of industrialization, on the massive shift of population from the countryside into towns, the doubling, tripling, quadrupling of the population in many urban areas and the social tensions, class tensions that this provoked. 
Okay? It's one uh, source of instability. But we should also think about the business cycle, the cycle of boom and recession or depression that exacerbated the social tensions that I just mentioned. So many intellectuals and politicians believed that the state should be able to manage the economy in order to lessen the impact of the business cycle, if not to eliminate it altogether. So laissez-faire, as I mentioned, dominated the economic thought in the 19th century, but the disciples of Saint-Simon had never entirely disappeared from the scene. So particularly after the economic depression of the 1890s, which was devastating through Europe, the number of advocates of economic planning steadily increased. Okay, now on to our next motivation for uh, engaging in experiments of scientific management of society. Um, perhaps the most important of these is preparation for war. And this particular point, uh, I think, is, is best developed in <clears throat> an, a chapter in a, a book called John Gillis, Militarization of the Western, Western World. And I would encourage you to read uh, Jeffrey Best's chapter called The Militarization of European Society, from which I, yes, nick this particular bit. So the great powers of Europe were taking an increasing interest in planning for a slightly different reason uh, than in the late 19th century. So in the late 19th century, Central Europe was engaged in an arms race. Now in 1870, uh, Germany, or, or more accurately, Prussia, seized Alsace-Lorraine from France in the Franco-Prussian War. Germany's rapid industrialization had created an impressive source of armament, which mobilized to war and combined with a general conscription made for a devastating military force. And France immediately sought to copy German models to catch up. Britain, meanwhile, observed very closely, particularly as the Germans clearly had ambitions to build a navy that could challenge Britain's control of the seas. So in a few short years, most of the European powers had laws in place to facilitate universal conscription. Production for military purposes expanded across Europe, but more importantly, European states in the late 19th and early 20th centuries were busily planning how they could maximally mobilize the country's resources, including private enterprise and the able-bodied populations, in the event of war. So this certainly runs very much counter to laissez-faire. Right? The state is thinking about how it can mobilize all resources, human and material, in the event of war. And World War I itself, when war does break out in 1914, World War I itself, more than anything else, brought the idea of state planning to center stage. In fact, mobilization for World War I ultimately took on totalitarian dimensions. And it served to inspire both Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union to apply and extend the lessons learned. It should be observed in this context that central planning is very often associated with the Soviet Union. And there is a tendency to assume that central planning must have come from Marx, that it is somehow communist. Because in fact, uh, it does not come from any kind of central uh, 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 sort of Marxist text. When Lenin institutes uh, central planning in Civil War Russia, he is very specifically uh, copying the German war economy of World War I. Okay, so back to World War I and um, 
what states are doing. Um, we should observe here that plans for total mobilization uh, did not go into immediate effect at the beginning of hostilities in 1914. That is, everybody pretty much anticipated it would be a short war. And when these plans were an, uh, uh, initiated, they weren't, uh, in the first instance, particularly effective. Um, so uh, their planning wasn't all that successful. France, for example, practically emptied farms and factories of able-bodied men. And having sent them all to the front, it became clear rather quickly that there weren't enough men left on the home front to feed and supply the army. The Germans figured things out a little more quickly, in no small part because they were subject to a blockade. And they had to be extremely careful to manage scarce resources. Britain was among the last to shift to planning, economic planning and total mobilization. But the reliance on free capitalist production resulted in chaos, that is in shortages and misallocated resources. So the British created the Ministry of Munitions in May 1915. The Ministry of Munitions, May 1915, with huge powers to mobilize, commandeer, confiscate or nationalize resources and to direct centrally the process of mobilization for war. But remember that this isn't just about economic plans and planning. We are talking here about the total mobilization of human and material resources to the achievement of aims identified by the state. In the course of World War I, keep in mind that civil liberties were substantially curtailed. Trades unions in France Britain and Germany were persuaded not to exercise the right to strike, or they were simply prohibited from doing so. Political police forces in World War I worked overtime to catch spies and subversives. Populations were subject in the course of World War I to a barrage of patriotic propaganda. Doesn't it start to sound a bit like the Soviet Union under Stalin or Nazi Germany. And it should not come as any surprise if it does, because in essence this is a peak um, in the growth of the state. And it is something that Hitler and Stalin and indeed Lenin before him were acutely aware of and saw the potential to employ in their new states. So now let me say a few words from here about planning, rather than this notion of scientific management. I want to talk about Nazi and Soviet economic plans. Okay, um, okay starting with a few words about Soviet economic planning. The Bolsheviks, as other Marxist revolutionaries, had always been inspired by the ideas of Saint-Simon. But as I said, it wasn't Marx that they looked to for the organization of their economy. They looked to the German war, war economy for a concrete model of how to run a planned economy. Okay? Um, I mean, I suppose by way of an aside, um, it's worth keeping in mind that Marx thought that the revolution would occur in the most advanced capitalist countries, that is either in Germany or in Britain. And the idea there was that uh, capitalism tended towards monopoly, and that once there ceased to be any competition, once all resources were concentrated in the hands of a few capitalists, uh, the working class would be immiserated, would ha have little power, and that they would rise up and seize this advanced uh, 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 network of production uh, and control it in their name. 
So what the Bolsheviks were doing, the Bolsheviks in this sense are, are revisionists of Orthodox Marxism. And they're taking control in a backward country, the Bolsheviks are. And Lenin's idea is that he can take control of the means of production and use that state control to skip the stage of capitalism. Okay? So imagine that they want to create a communist society, an advanced society, in conditions of extraordinary backwardness. Okay? So this is one of the reasons that they want to engage in planning. It's about overcoming backwardness. Um, and they're attracted to planning too because it's not capitalist. Okay? Um, right, let me get back to this then. Um, okay. So they're attracted, Lenin, to, uh, and, and the Bolsheviks, to the German war economy. Um, and the German economy at war had survived Allied blockade. And in successfully mobilizing all the country's material and human resources, had managed to prolong World War I beyond um, all expectations. Basically, the Bolsheviks faced a similar uh, scenario. In order to retain power in Russia, they needed to defeat the combined forces of all the anti-Bolshevik army, the Whites, and various Allied expeditionary forces. So there were Czech forces and British forces and American forces trying to overthrow the Bolsheviks too. And they faced, the Bolsheviks also faced a kind of blockade, confined as they were in the first instance to the sort of heartland of European Russia around Moscow and Petrograd. Okay? So their situation is, is not uh, dissimilar to that of, uh, of Germany at war. And in these first years, okay, what they did amounted to little more than a total military mobilization directed from Moscow. I mean, one can question how much actual sort of concrete planning there was at this point. So all enterprises in Bolshevik Russia were nationalized. And all labor conscripted and all resources, including agricultural production, subject to seizure. So this was hardly the first steps in a transition to a utopian society, the utopian society that they had envisaged. In fact, the first experiment, this first, uh, first years of Bolshevik power, are referred to often as war communism. It certainly helped them to win the Civil War, but it had to be abandoned in the early 1920s because the workers were angry that this so-called proletarian revolution, which had promised them liberation from capitalist exploitation, resulted in a fierce military order in the factories. And the peasantry, meanwhile, was on the verge of open rebellion after years of grain seizures. But on the most basic level, almost three years of civil war had brought the economy to its knees. So it was necessary to try something else to encourage a recovery. So in the early 1920s, the Bolsheviks retreated from war communism, from this system of total mobilization, in favor of an economy that allowed for private production and trade, that is, some elements of capitalism, in order to allow the economy to recover. But as soon as it did, the Soviet leadership returned to the idea of planning, renationalizing enterprises, and taking control of agricultural production by forcing peasants into collective farms, and once again coordinating the total mobilization of the resources of the nation, not to war in this case, but to rapid industrialization. And curiously, the imagery of Soviet plans remained military. So this is discussion of heroes of labor, where they were leaders of production campaigns on the industrial front, all in the context of capitalist encirclement, all these sort of military images that are used to describe what they're doing 
in industry. Nevertheless, planning was no longer merely about the survival of the regime, but rather about building the material foundations of a socialist society. Okay, so it is directed at building communism. So capitalist production was eliminated and all material and human resources were coordinated in the five-year economic plans. Plans were not without their problems. We had bottlenecks, shortages and the like, as I discussed in that uh, introductory lecture. But the overall results were impressive. Huge new plants were constructed from one end of the country to the other. Unemployment was eliminated. Output in all major categories of industrial production leapt forward. And remember that the period of the first Soviet five-year plans coincided with the Great Depression in Europe. And the great Soviet successes provided a stark contrast to the apparent collapse of the European and North American economies. Naturally, this provided grist for the mills of public policy debate in Europe. Was economic planning the solution to the crisis of capitalism? Throughout Europe, policymakers on the left and the right, that is, both those sympathetic to and openly hostile to Bolshevism, seriously considered and promoted forms of economic planning as a solution to the economic crises of the Depression. If they didn't look to the Soviet Union as a model, they at least looked to the achievements of wartime mobilization and the potential of focused cooperation of government, labor, and factory owners to deal with the fundamental problems of their respective societies. So I want to think about now the responses of various uh, uh, countries to the, um, uh, the Depression, and particularly we want to look at uh, Britain and then Nazi Germany before thinking about uh, planning in the post-war. Okay, so a few words about uh, Britain and economic planning. In Britain, as I hinted, uh, both the Tories and the Labour Party agreed on the need for economic planning. And they agreed that planning wasn't necessary just to overcome the current economic crisis, but to correct the defect defects of laissez-faire capitalism generally. So you have to understand that the Depression is perceived, both on the left and the right, as essentially crisis of capitalism, if you will. A sense that laissez-faire capitalism, there's a faith in laissez-faire capitalism in the 19th century that is, by the 1930s, broken. So, uh, Labour and the Tories did not, it must be said, intend to do away with capitalism as such, though many on the left would have liked to. The nationalization of entire industries was contemplated and in some cases ultimately undertaken, but even labor saw the need for private ownership in the process of a lengthy transition to a socialist society. So there were various government commissions, think tanks and public policy groups drawing up plans for a British planned economy. Every proposal put forward was dogged with controversy, not only between Tories and Labour, but within both parties. So they agreed that planning was a good thing, but how exactly to implement it was a, a matter of debate. So the Tories were generally worried about how things um, uh, they were worried about how to organize the relationship between industrial leaders and government. They were concerned about things like the role of profit in a planned economy. Labour, meanwhile, was divided about the role of trades unions in a planned economy. And in a sense, 
planning for the Tories equated to control of the workers, whereas for labour it involved the taming of profit, of exploitation. And in the end, because of the difficulty of agreeing a concrete approach to planning, the broad consensus on a need for a planned economy remained only in theory in the 1930s. Now moving on to Nazi Germany, um, by contrast to Britain, the Nazis had very little difficulty in combining an enthusiasm for economic planning with a rabid hostility to Bolshevism. And what they did was they managed to demonstrate that planning wasn't incompatible with capitalist principles. So Nazi planning followed a four-year cycle against the Soviet five-year plans. Oh, big change there, big difference. But like not, uh, Bolshevik planning, Nazi planning involved the total mobilization of human and material resources to aims identified by the party. So in the Soviet Union, the aim was to build socialism. And in Nazi Germany, the aim was to prepare for war. So like Soviet plans, the Nazi plans were a great success. They too overcame unemployment. They too achieved extraordinary increases in production in the context of a European depression. The great difference between Bolshevik and Nazi plans lay in the uh, matter of ownership. Now some Nazi industries were nationalized, but most industries remained in private hands. So we have, for example, Bayer and Siemens in chemicals, Krupps in steel, Mercedes in automobile production and so on. But instead of producing for the market and competing with other producers for a share of demand, they met targets identified in the plan and at levels of profit that were identified in the plan. The government then negotiated wage rates and conditions together with enterprises, theoretically balancing their interests, but ultimately, uh, rather not, not very subtly, their interests fell to the side of the capitalists rather than to those of the, of the workers. So the big difference then between Nazi and Soviet plans, as I said, is in the matter of ownership. So the idea of uh, central planning doesn't disappear with the defeat of Nazi Germany. So if we think about 1945, we have Nazi Germany defeated and now the Soviet Union vilified as the new enemy in the Cold War. But the idea of planning remains. And the question for uh, policymakers is, what should the role of the state be in the management of society, not just the economy? So again, all of these arguments that we discussed earlier remain. That is, the state is still perceived to have a role in overcoming backwardness, in social engineering, in providing economic and social stability, and indeed in preparing for war. Okay? Now, if we think about economic planning in the post-war, it is very much there, particularly in Europe. Not on the scale of the Soviet Union, or as it had been in Nazi Germany, but there are, in the, in the, the post-war, further nationalizations, further state intervention in the economy, rather more in, in terms of large public spending pro, uh, uh, projects and, and sort of Keynesian economics. But there are multi-year economic plans in France. Um, in Britain, we see occasional interventions to control uh, wages and prices. So this is uh, essentially, again, about the state intervening to lessen, to mitigate the uh, swings from boom to recession. So wage and price controls. We see the state also in, engaged in uh, big projects, that is, again, about highways and dams and 
uh, in the case of, of America, it's about putting man on the moon is another one of those giant state projects uh, that is, in essence, planned. Um, and also social engineering uh, remains a motivation uh, for states, uh, especially with the evolution of the welfare state and the provision of universal health care. So we see universal health care, social insurance, publicly funded pensions, public works, council housing, okay? And these are things that we now uh, sort of take as a given, right? That the state should intervene to protect people from the worst effects of capitalism, okay? And this is this, this same notion of the scientifically managed society that has its roots in Saint-Simon, in the uh, Enlightenment. So the welfare state in the post-war uh, Europe is uh, the example, really, of the big interventionist state. It's not a totalitarian state. This is not about total mass mobilization. But, like Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, it is about state intervention to achieve broad social ideals. Most important here, this is all about the growing state since the late 18th century and the increasing ambitions of the state to control and manage society. So what you have to ask yourself is, yes, there are very real differences between what is happening in the totalitarian states and the democratic states. But are these a differences of degree or are they wholly qualitative differences that allow us to argue that totalitarianism is a distinct, discrete and unique phenomenon? And I'll leave that for you to think about, to read further, to draw your own conclusions. So until next week, when we will talk about something, I don't have the lecture list in front of me, so wait for it, it'll come.